Amen. Mark chapter 15, uh, we're coming to the place where Jesus is going to be crucified. Verse 24 says, when they crucified him. Uh, Crucifixion was a cruel, torturing uh, process by which a person was basically tortured to death, but kept alive as long as possible. Under uh, normal circumstances, the person convicted of a crime, whatever crime that might be, their accusation would be put above their head, and the crime they committed, the person would be nailed to uh, the cross, and they uh, would be a billboard to show what would happen if you violate Roman law. Uh, This is a replica of the type of nails that were used uh, in crucifixion. They would generally take the nail and drive it into the hand. Now, keep in mind, this in ancient culture was part of the hand too. So the nail would have been driven into that part of his hands you put it through there which is traditionally seen in in many pictures and paintings that could not support the weight of the body it would tear through but right in there would hold a victim on the the cross and so when Jesus said behold my hands he was referring to what was there and that was considered part of the hand uh, in ancient culture And, of course, they would put the the foot one upon the other and then drive the nail into both of the feet, into the wood. But Jesus had already been going through some physical trauma before this. This this is just uh, the culmination of his physical trauma. What were some of the things that he's already gone through? Scourging. His back would have been lacerated and just ripped to shreds as a result of the scourging process. That was a, uh, something that was used to, to cause a person to go up to the point of death. They would, they would scourge a person almost to the point of death and then back off. And then a lot of people died as a result of it. So you have the scourging. What else? The crown of thorns placed upon his head. And of course, as it was placed upon his head, pressed down, and then they took a reed and, and just hit the top of his head with it. So it was to cause further damage. So you had uh, the blood coming from his lacerated back and legs, which uh, the, the, the scourging would in- include the legs as well, the back part of the legs. Uh, you have the blood coming from the head, what else? Pierce to side. Now, we haven't got to that point yet. That will be later on, but you're right. That will happen after he is dead, after he's on the cross. But before he, gets, before he even goes to the cross, he's got the thorn, he's got the scourging, the hitting, the spitting, the mocking, uh, the, yeah, the agony in the garden. So his, uh, his emotional trauma, his physical trauma, uh, his uh, bloody sweat, hematidrosis that Luke records for us, he was beginning to shed his blood even at that point. And, and then uh, the fatigue of being up all night and uh, going through these mock trials and... And then go, and during the beating, blindfolded, beaten, that would have drawn blood. So he has already shed a, a great amount of blood up until this point. So we, we can see why he fell under the weight of the cross. Physically exhausted, beaten, scourged. The uh, blood loss, uh, people would 
generally go into shock when they are severely um, severely injured, as as that would happen on the process in the process of scourging. So it's a wonder that he made it as far as he did. He must have been a very strong individual physically. Of course, we know, and we talked about this earlier when we studied the book of Mark, going back to the fact that he was a carpenter. Carpenters were very much involved in physical, manual labor, going out, cutting down the trees, and, and bringing the wood to the carpenter's shop. So before he started his earthly ministry, he was a, a person who involved himself in hard, manual labor as a carpenter. He learned that trade from uh, Joseph. Of course. Not only that, but the potential capacity. I mean, you can be as fit as you can be, it's going to have the mental. Right. 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 The exactly the mental focus he had to go to the cross to to be able to 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 know what was about to happen to him. With not only the physical aspect of it, but the spiritual of being the sin bearer of humanity and being separated from the Father, and just the the heartbreak of rejection. This, these are his people; these are his kinsmen, so to speak, his fellow countrymen. They're doing this to him, and he hasn't done anything wrong at all. Period. Nothing. No personal sins, no, he never did anything wrong to anyone, never thought an evil thought. I mean, truly, this is an innocent man that is being abused and killed. So it says in verse 24, Mark chapter 15 and verse 24, they crucified him, divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine uh, what every man should take. Uh, Psalm 22 talks about that. That's a prophecy fulfilled in uh, Psalm 22. Uh, the, the casting of lots for the garment. Mark doesn't discuss that, but Matthew does because Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. Mark doesn't discuss that prophecy. And verse 25 says, And it was the third hour of the day, and they crucified him. Again, you just, say, you just see how the writers um, just mention it. Because they were very familiar with it. Those who received this were very familiar with the concept of crucifixion. They probably had seen people crucified. So there was no need of an explanation as to what goes on into that. Uh, if you go on Apologetics Press website and go and look up the uh, crucifixion, there is a medical detailed uh, Analysis of what a human body would go through through the process of crucifixion. And it's, it's a very uh, interesting read in which you, you see uh, the physical trauma that, that Jesus uh, would have endured on the cross for us. And not only that, but also on top of that, the spiritual. So that's something that you can do in your own time. ApologeticsPress.com has some good information there. Verse 26, the inscription of his accusation was written above the king of the Jews. When they also crucified, uh, with him they also crucified two robbers. One on his right hand and the other on his left. So he wasn't alone. This was a day that they were executing uh, three people. The king of the Jews was the accusation it was put in three different languages. Remember what the other accounts say? Greek, Hebrew, and I believe it's Aramaic. Those were the three languages that were very prominent in that region so people could see you know, and read this, this is uh, his accusation. And... Mark doesn't record this, but the others do record how the Jews didn't want that put up on there. They didn't want that because that was, uh, that was uh, actually stating a truth that they didn't believe. They wanted it said that he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have put, I have, I have put. 
So the king of the Jews was meant to say this is his crime, but that crime was the truth. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Okay. Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. What verse was that? John 19.20, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. That way everyone that was in that area for the feast day who spoke those different languages would be able to understand. And so it's um, third hour of the day, that would be 9 o'clock in the morning on that Friday morning. Verse 28, the scriptures was fulfilled which says he was numbered with the transgressors. That's from Isaiah 53 and verse 12. One of the rare instances where Mark actually uh, cites a scripture. But Isaiah 53, the whole chapter is dealing with the suffering of Christ. He was numbered with the transgressors. That means he was counted among those who were sinners. He was placed among the sinners. He didn't have any sin, but he was uh, definitely placed among those who were transgressors, numbered with them. Verse 29, those who passed by blaspheme him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who destroy the temple, build it in three days. Save yourself and come down from the cross. Where he was crucified, there's, there's several places in, in modern day Jerusalem where they claim it, it's the, the site of the crucifixion. But it's generally believed that where Jesus was crucified, which would be outside the city walls, there was, it was close to a road so people could see it. Again, the whole billboard concept of people seeing what's going on. How would you like to go into town? The first thing you see in the town is some people being executed. Uh, that would be a, an impression of uh, how serious uh, this government is. And so... Um, you have uh, this going on, and the people who had walked by and the people who were watching that was what was going on were mocking. And again, this was common to, to, to mock the person uh, that was being uh, crucified. And of course, they're, they're misusing his word, misapplying uh, what he said, destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Verse 31, likewise, the chief priest also mocking among themselves and said he saved others. Himself he cannot save. You know what's ironic about that statement in verse 31, that if he did save himself, others could not be saved. That's what's ironic about that. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Well, that's not true. He could have saved himself. But if he had saved himself, others could not be saved. Of course, that's not what that person meant. Saying, well, look, he helped all these other people. He can't help himself. He's powerless now. They're mocking him. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now. And, of course, he's using sarcasm. He really doesn't believe he's the Christ, the King of Israel. Descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. You have all these miracles and power. Come off the cross and we will believe. I believe that probably was one of the strongest temptations Jesus had to face. One of the strongest. And that, and that of course, is coming from Satan. Come down off the cross and we'll, be, we'll believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. That last sentence there in verse 32 tells us that both of the thieves at first were reviling him. But one of them had a change of heart. That's the one you find in Luke, where Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. When he turned, his heart changed. But at first, both of them were. And we have to keep in mind, he was on the cross for about a period of six hours. So a lot transpired. It didn't just happen within a 15-minute period of time. So both of them were reviling Christ at first, but Luke records um, how that that one repented and uh, came to Christ for salvation. 
Verse 33, when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. This is very significant. Verse 34, in the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a quotation from Psalm 22, verse 1. That's the very first line in Psalm 22. And in Psalm 22, that that psalm that talks about the Messiah, talks about bulls have surrounded me. The evil have surrounded me. They pierced my hands and feet. David was talking about crucifixion before crucifixion was even invented. When David wrote Psalm 22, there was no such thing as crucifixion. But he wrote what the Holy Spirit had him to write. They pierced my hands and feet, which is talking about crucifixion. That's another proof that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Because God knew what would happen. David didn't know. But that's a prophecy of how the Messiah would die. Pierce his hands and his feet. But you go back to verse 33 and 34. You see here the sixth hour. What would be the sixth hour in our time? Noon. Noon. Because you have the third hour is nine in the morning, verse 25. Third hour of the day is nine in the morning. Remember on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, these men aren't drunk. It's only the third hour of the day. I mean, nine in the morning. Usually people don't get drunk at nine in the morning is what he's saying. So you have three more hours added to that. It's noon. At noon, it's supposed to be the brightest outside. But darkness was over the whole land until the ninth hour. For three hours, there was darkness that fell. Now some have tried, and in ancient writings, it records. Ancient historians record that there was a period of darkness during the governorship of Pilate when this actually happened. But they try to give a natural explanation to it and they say it was an eclipse. That doesn't work because it was a period of time of the Passover which was a full moon. During a full moon you don't have a solar eclipse. You can't have a solar eclipse during a full moon. So there's no naturalistic explanation to this darkness that happened, that even historians of that day record. They say it happened, but they try to explain it away um, by natural means. Well, even if it wasn't, it wouldn't last for three hours. Exactly. A natural eclipse would only last a few minutes as the, you know, the moon's passing in front of the, the sun. That shadow is only there. So that's another indicator. That's, it's not a natural thing. Was there ever a time in biblical history when God caused it to get dark? In, in, in the Old Testament? The book of Exodus, plague of darkness. He made it to be dark for the Egyptians, but those in Goshen, they had light. Well, that's kind of an interesting thing there. They had light in Goshen where the Israelites were, but there was a darkness that fell over the people in Egypt. So it's a supernatural darkness, something that doesn't happen natural. And some have guessed whether this was referring to the whole land of Palestine or the whole part of the world, and there's been some speculation that it could have been a a worldwide phenomenon. Of course, you'd only need half the world because the other half's dark anyway. So... It could have been. But one thing that we can say for sure, for certain, this was a supernatural darkness that fell when the sun should have been at its zenith and shining the brightest. It got dark. And in movies, I've never seen a movie that really depicts this correctly. They show it gets cloudy. It gets cloudy. No. This was darkness. It wasn't getting cloudy. That's not darkness falling over the land. That doesn't adequately fit what's happening. Right. You ever been in one of the caves? Caves, uh, they got Cave of the Winds, you got Carlsbad. You ever go down there and they turn the light out? And your eye is trying to... 
focus and trying to find any kind of light source to zero in on. To, and there's nothing. There, there's no light at all. Utter, complete darkness. Now, what does the Bible talk about hell? It's outer darkness. It's called the blackness of darkness in the book of Jude. So what we have here is we have God imposing upon nature a, the, the, the spiritual aspect of the death of Christ. From my study, I believe that Jesus died in two ways on the cross. He died spiritually for our sins, the sins of everyone else, and then he died physically. So I think there is a twofold death of Jesus on the cross, and he was separated from the Father. This is what he was dreading the most. Yes, he was dreading the physical pain and suffering, as any human would, but he was dreading this. He was going to have all the sins of the human race placed upon him and be found uh, to be sin, made to be sin. Now let's look at a passage that talks about that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It talks about the death of Christ bringing about reconciliation in the context of and look at verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. He made him, that's God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made Jesus to be sin on the cross. He made Jesus to be rape, homosexuality, murder, child molestation. Think about that. All the sins that mankind comes up with were placed upon him. And therefore, because he became the sin bearer, he became sin, what does the Bible say of God? God cannot look upon sin. He, he cannot have fellowship with sin. Sin separates. So, the father had to turn from his son. And so when Jesus quoted Psalm 22 and verse 1, Why have you forsaken me? He was not just quoting scripture. It had happened. The Father forsook him because of sin. Not his own personal sin. He had none. But because of the sins of, that, of the human race that were placed upon him so that it could be said by Paul, he made him who knew no sin, he was innocent, to be sin for us. Jesus became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He did that so we could be righteous. So that shows you the magnitude of, of His death and, and, and what it meant and why it became dark for a period of three hours and why it was so significant. This was a spiritual death. The soul that sins, it shall die. Ezekiel 18 and verse 20. Well, Jesus didn't sin. But he bore sin. He became sin. So, death, separation. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. He became sin, therefore he was separated from God because of the sins of everybody else. So that, that is the significance. And it's, it's, hard to, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around it. It's very profound. Look at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Talking about the death of Christ, the means by which we can be justified by faith and have peace with God, Romans 5 and verse 1. Look at verse 6, Romans 5 and verse 6. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the ungodly sinners. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. 
But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We're saved from wrath. On the cross, Jesus was facing the wrath of God in our behalf so that we wouldn't have to if we believe in him and obey his will and are loyal to him we could receive the the righteousness of God in Christ so th- this shows the significance of of his death and there's there there's no no other way to be saved no other way to to receive forgiveness and be reconciled to God there's no plan b and nothing that man comes up with can circumvent what God did. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 21. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin. Nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. That would be the scourging aspect of it. For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So his death was unique in that not, he, not so much uh, because of the physical suffering. There were two other people being crucified with him. They were going through physical suffering too. But they were not dying the way he died. They were dying for their sins. He was dying for their sins. He was dying for the ones that were mocking him. He was dying for the ones that beat him. He was dying for the ones that spit on him. Dying for the ones that drove the nails in his hands and his feet. That's why it records in the other accounts, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. And then he did provide forgiveness on the day of Pentecost. And because, uh, because I, I know from the scripture that the devil is a limited being, I think the devil thought that this was going to be the end of it for Christ. I think the devil thought he had him here um, and there was no getting out of it. I don't think uh, Satan fully understood uh, the scheme of redemption. He, he, he was limited just like uh, other spiritual beings that are created beings. And so um, that's why the resurrection is such a triumph, such a, a victory. Because you have this death here that he's dying. Any questions or comments about this before we go any further? And and this process of dying that we have is, you know, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper for us to be reminded of that. And it was so designed to be a part of the worship of the church that we begin every week being reminded of what Jesus did on the cross for us. There's no way a rational mind can read all this and say Jesus went through all of this, but there are many roads to heaven. That is ridiculous. At best, ridiculous. That's why Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, because this is, this is what he did to take care of the sin problem, to reconcile us back to God, to bring us back. There's, there's no other way. God's not going to let his son go through all of this and then let humans come up with their own way of doing it and say, okay, I'll accept that too. 
You're going to bypass everything I've done for you and come up with your own invention and expect me to accept it? That's what they're asking of God. And that, that's not the, the biblical teaching at all. Well, when he says Eloi, Eloi, that's the Hebrew word for God. Elohim, Elohim. It sounds very much like Elijah. And so they're hearing him say this, and so they think he's calling for Elijah. Verse 35, look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to take him down. Let's see if Elijah will actually save him. Now, they had a misunderstanding about Elijah coming. They thought Elijah was literally going to come. And the Bible tells us, and Jesus tells us, that Elijah did come. And who was Elijah? John the Baptist. He was Elijah. He came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Not literal Elijah. No more than Jesus is literally David. When the prophecies in the book of Ezekiel talk about David's going to rule over the people. And that's referring to Jesus. Not literally David, it's referring to Jesus. Even today, when they have their Passover feast, what do the Jews do traditionally? They leave a seat open at their Passover meal in case Elijah suddenly appears. They literally think he's going to literally appear someday. These are the Jews that reject Christianity. So let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. This would have been the sixth hour on the cross. There were uh, <clears throat> other sayings on the cross as well that the other writers record. We have kind of an abbreviation of, of what goes on on the cross. So six hours he's on the cross and he breathed his last. Here's his physical death. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Matthew records, Mark doesn't, that there was an earthquake and that the tombs were open and saints that had died were resurrected. And after his resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. To me, that seems to indicate these were recently dead people that could be identified. And it was after his resurrection when they went into the city and appeared to people. Matthew only records that. But Mark, he doesn't record it. He just talks about the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom when that earthquake happened when Jesus actually died. What's the significance of verse 38? Right. Exactly. Right. It was, it was a very, very tall chamber. Very, very tall veil. Top to bottom. That means there wasn't someone, it wasn't someone tearing it from the bottom up. You couldn't reach it. Plus, it is said that this veil that was in there was very thick. Very thick. A person couldn't go up and just rip it. It was very thick fabric. And it was uh, ripped from top to bottom, like you said, to separate the holy from the holy of holies. So what God was saying, and he was, there were priests that witnessed this, because it was during the time, by the way, when Jesus died, that the evening sacrifices were going on. That's not a coincidence. He died during the time the evening sacrifices were taking place there in the temple. So when that earthquake happened, they would have felt that. Then the veil ripped. They would have saw that. This was a, a visual aid to say now access has been granted by the death of Christ. By the death of Jesus of Nazareth, his sacrifice having been made, 
the, the, the veil has been ripped open. Access has now been granted. What did they do in the book of Leviticus to, to, to get rid of their sin problem temporarily until the Messiah came? They would have an animal. They'd place their hands upon it, confess the sins of the people, and they would sacrifice the animal. Well, that's exactly what actually happened with Jesus. Not that they placed their sins upon him in a, in a formal sense. God placed their sins upon him. He became sin for them, for us. And so by his... Uh, Death on the cross, that veil being ripped open, indicated now access has been granted. Verse 39, when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. The other accounts say that he said that he was a righteous man. He, that means you put them both together. He said both things. He was a righteous man. He was the Son of God. This centurion, I want you to think about what transpired with the death of Christ. The supernatural darkness, the earthquake, and what was going on there. This centurion uh, would have been someone that was very much well versed in executing people. He probably had done numerous executions. But the death of Jesus was so phenomenally different that it caused him to say this. This man was truly uh, the son of God or a righteous man. So the, it made an impression upon this centurion as to what happened. Verse 40, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome. Verse 41, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So you had the women, those faithful women that were there. Uh, they were looking on what happened from afar. And so, in the time we have remaining, uh, verses 42 through 47, they, they bury the body of Jesus. Verse 42, when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning a centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Mark does not record the, the spear piercing the side of Jesus, but John does. John's account, uh, they wanted to hasten the death of those who were being crucified because it was the preparation day, the day before the Sabbath. They wanted to get, get them off the cross. They weren't supposed to have that going on during uh, a Sabbath day. And so the soldiers broke the legs of the other two. They didn't break Jesus' legs because they went up to him and he was already dead. They pierced his side. But they broke the legs of the other two to hasten their death because when, in the process of, of crucifixion, one of the things that's very difficult to do is to breathe. And you actually have to pull yourself up and push up with your feet up on the cross to inhale and exhale. And you're sliding up and down on that cross to try to breathe. And you think about that for six hours with your lacerated back. And so they broke the legs of those uh, thieves so that they couldn't push themselves up and they would suffocate. People who were crucified could last for several days on a cross. Uh, but because this was up against the Sabbath, they had to get the bodies off. Very ironic that these people who killed the Son of God were worried about religious regulations. It was religious people that killed the Savior. These weren't atheists at the foot of the cross. 
We know atheists are not right with God. We understand that. We know atheists. But it was religious people. Some of the most dangerous people in the world are religious people that are in the wrong religion or have a misconception of religion. And so, Joseph of Arimathea, it says of him that he, taking courage, taking courage, went and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead, summoning the centurion. He asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Verse 46, Then he brought he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in linen, laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of rock, and rolled a stone against the door. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. This was a hasty process. The Sabbath was about to begin. Their days begin at 6 p.m. He dies at 3 in the afternoon. They only have three hours to work with before the Sabbath starts. Starts at 6 p.m. The Jewish day does. So they got, they got to get him off the cross they got to get him put away, buried, and then after the Sabbath, in their minds, they're going to go and finish the burial process. So they, they just wrapped him in linen. And so it, it was a hasty job because uh, the Sabbath was right upon, right upon them just a few hours away. And the, the linen, was that would have been a normal way of, of wrapping a body. They would have wrapped him up. And uh, wrap the head separately. It would been it would look like a cocoon, basically, of a human form, and placed him in uh, the tomb, stone rolled in front of it. Mark doesn't record this, but of course, the Jews wanted uh, guards placed there, guards placed on duty because they did not want. Um, his followers to come and steal his body, which was silly because those, his followers were scared to death. They were scattered. And there's no way that they were going to try to do that. But of course, and we won't have time to get into this because we only have just about a minute. Chapter 16 and verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, so he dies on Friday afternoon, buried. He's in the tomb all day on the Sabbath. Sabbath, he rested in the tomb. His body rested. On the first day of the week, Sabbath was passed. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. They were coming to finish the burial process. Verse 2, very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were concerned about who rolled the stone away. And of course we know that it was rolled away by an angel. Just have time to mention this. The first day of the week. This is why we meet upon the first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7. Upon the first day of the week. The disciples gathered together to break bread. Which is the Lord's Supper. The day of worship. It replaced the Sabbath as being a day of observance. It's not a day of rest. It's not like the Sabbath day. That was given to Israel. But it was a day of the saints assembling together. So it's a new covenant. A new day. The Sabbath was for the old. And now the first day of the week for the new. And next week Lord willing. We will get deeper into Mark chapter 16. And then we'll be finished with the book of Mark. Yes. Sure. Mm Mm-hmm. I'd have to look into that aspect of it, but broken, I've always uh, come to realize or come to believe that it's just referring to like someone like they're injured, broken, uh, in the sense like someone gets a cut, they broke the skin. 
not the broken bones, but his body was broken by being abused and tortured. So I, I never saw it as referring to broken bones, but a broken body, just in the sense of what he went through. But I'll, I'll get into that deeper to see if, uh, of what that footnote is talking about.